thank you everybody for joining uh, this panel. We're gonna talk about apprenticeships in healthcare and sort of this new trend of incorporating a tried and true training method and model into the healthcare system. Uh, today we have Cole Mack with us. He's from the Montana Registered Apprenticeship Program with the Department of Labor here in Montana. And we have Stephanie Galvin, who is an LPN with Community Health Partners out of Livingston. And then we also have Amanda Roper, who is the Talent Partnership Consultant at Centura Health out of uh, Denver, Colorado. And so just to start, um, and, and again, my name is Luke Lavin. I'm the Apprenticeship Coordinator at Flathead Valley Community College. And to our attendees, our high school students, thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you have questions, you can submit those through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And then at the end, if we have time, I can ask those to the panelists and kind of go from there. Uh, but just to get started, and Stephanie, if you don't mind, I'll start with you. Just tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got into, you know, the position, the role that you're in currently. Uh, so again, yeah, Stephanie Galvin, um, LPN with Community Health Partners in Livingston. Uh, I started in medical probably about 18, 19 years ago as a medical assistant. Um, and then I just, you know, I had always wanted to pursue nursing as a career. I just had put that on hold to raise my family first, but after my youngest was in high school and I was able to have a little bit more time, I decided to go back to school um, for the LPN program. Um, so. Awesome. And cool, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, like what get brought you into maybe healthcare, healthcare world, but then also apprenticeships? All right, sure. Um, so I got my bachelor's degree in community health. Um, I was actually intending to be a paramedic. Um, when I was in the Marine Corps, I trained as an EMT and thought being a paramedic would be great. And then got to college and switched majors. Um, but ended up working with uh, a lot of youth in some uh, training programs, Job Corps, things like that. And from there, transitioned over to apprenticeship to try to help kind of facilitate that connection from high school into career and workforce. Awesome. And Amanda, you want to tell us a little bit about what you do and what brought you to that point? Yeah. So I work at Centura Health. We are actually the largest healthcare provider in Colorado. We also operate in Western Kansas. Um, I actually started out in elementary education and got a little bit burnt out there and um, wanted to find a career that still fulfilled my passion of helping people. So that's kind of how I landed in healthcare and landed in the arena of helping people find jobs and getting them into some of those entry-level healthcare positions. Very cool. Um, Stephanie, now that you've been you know, an LPN, um, has there been a craziest moment that's happened to you, either sort of training during your career um, that just really stands out as, man, that was never expected that or something, you know, just. Um, yeah, definitely, just recently, actually. Um, you know, I'm working in family practice right now, and we see a lot of um, patients on a regular basis for routine health care. But every once in a while, you get someone that walks through that door that you just don't expect it to happen. And, um, you yeah, walk had someone just walking off the street with a stab wound in his neck and had to address that, like, immediately. And that's not usually something I deal with because I'm not in the hospital. I mean, um, so it kind of took me by surprise. <laughs> it's like, you never know what you're going to get, what's going to walk through your door. So you got to try to be prepared for every situation at every minute. I'm sure. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I, I appreciate everyone that's involved in healthcare. It's not a career I could ever do or go into, but I am very thankful that all of you do it and take care of all of us that don't. Um, awesome. What, uh, do you feel that there's a, a trait or a skill that's very critical to being either a successful student in nursing or, you know, as a, a professional LPN, RN? Yeah, you know, just being willing to learn, um, learning from your mistakes is a huge thing. Um, you know, you go through your whole school, when you're choosing a medical career, you're going to go through your entire formal educational training at whatever school you choose. Um, but there's always more to learn. And I think employers really um, appreciate when you take those extra steps to learn more. So um, in my career, I've always looked for further 
um, education opportunities that weren't you know only in the class that I had taken, but to learn what's not in the class that you've taken, just so you can make yourself more uh, of an asset to wherever it is that you're working. So I believe that you know just always um, that willing willingness to learn and to continually better yourself is is really important. Is there anything, Amanda, you'd want to add on to that that you've seen, whether nursing, medical assistance, search text, just, you know, in terms of what makes a successful you know, healthcare employee from the employer standpoint? Absolutely. So when we do any of our recruiting, um, one of the main things that every hiring manager is looking for is someone who's ready to be a team player. Um, being a part of a healthcare team, there are a lot of different people um, doing a lot of different things with any given patient. So being ready to be a good listener and work with your teammates is something that we constantly look for and something that we always work with our current associates to even get better at. So definitely be ready to um, work with others and work well with others. Cole, is there anything you wanna to add to that that you've seen you know, from the apprenticeship side? Um, you know, as Amanda and Stephanie stated, you know, the, being, a, being a good team member and being willing to learn, um, we often refer to it as being coachable. So being able to take some, some direction and at times uh, corrections and criticism in, in what you're doing. Um, understand that when you show up to a job, you're not going to be the expert they want. And even if you've been in an occupation for 20 years, you may not still not be an expert. There's always something you can continue to learn. Um, the other thing with apprenticeships, so apprenticeships are a combination of on-the-job training and education. So it's more than just going to work and kind of, as Stephanie stated, continue to, you know, find ways that you can learn, continue to look for different things that you can educate yourself on. And so with apprenticeship, probably one of the, the more challenging aspects is getting people to complete their coursework. Um, showing up to work, you're getting a paycheck. So a lot of people will do that, but if they don't complete the coursework, they're only completing part of it. They're not completing the entire program. So understanding that, the, you know, just because you have a job, doesn't, you know, learning doesn't start when you, or it doesn't stop once you start that position. You got to continue throughout your entire career. Okay, good to know. Do you, do you mind, Cole, just taking a few minutes and just kind of walking us through what is a registered apprenticeship, the components of it, the, the pay scale? <laughs> So an apprenticeship is going to be, the minimum apprenticeship is going to be 2,000 hours of on-the-job training. And that's essentially a year of full-time work. Um, for every 2,000 hours someone does, there's about 144 hours what they call required technical instruction. Now, the required technical instruction, it can come from a college, it can come from a trade school, it can come from a certification or certifying organization. Um, there's a lot of different models out there. And just because the bare minimum is 2,000 hours doesn't mean that that's where all apprenticeships stop. Um, some apprenticeships can take five or six years, depending on how in depth one wants to go and, and the occupation, what the requirements are to get licensed and certified in that. Um, but really what apprenticeship is, is it's a, a earn while you learn model is what they call it. So you have a job, you're an employee first and a student second. That's kind of the difference between an apprenticeship and an internship. As an intern, most people are students first, and then they're kind of going out and getting that experience on the job. With an apprenticeship, you're getting the on the job experience and then supplementing it with the education. Um, with an apprenticeship, there is a pay scale as Luke stated. So there's an entry level wage and then there's a wage increase for skills gain. And then there's a journey worker wage or the final wage. Now, some programs, if they're gonna take you know, multiple years, may have multiple wage increases built in there. And what those wage increases are based on is your on the job training, your performance, and then also your your coursework. And so kind of going back to the folks that, you know, may not complete that coursework, um, you know, you put in a long day at work and you go home, you may not want to crack the books. Um, over time, that actually impacts the bottom line and impacts your salary because you won't be able to get those wage increases if you're not doing that coursework. One of the strategies that I will use when I'm working with an apprentice that may not be keeping up on their coursework is finding out if they have a partner or significant other and then calculate out the amount of money that they essentially lost by not doing their coursework and not telling the apprentice so much themselves, but telling their partner and then their, their partner generally uh, motivates them to complete the coursework. I imagine that's pretty effective. 
Um, Amanda, do you want to tell us a little bit about the, the program or programs that Central Health is done, uh, kind of how that's gone, and then maybe what prompted you to choose to you know, pursue an apprenticeship model? Yeah, so Centura Health, we currently have registered apprenticeship programs in medical assisting, pharmacy tech, sterile processing, medical lab tech, and surgical tech. Um, and currently also working on a nursing pathway to build an apprenticeship on. So we initially started with our medical assistant apprenticeship and the reasoning was, um, of course, we were very short on MAs across our entire system and found that uh, traditional medical assistant programs can be incredibly costly, um, upwards of $30,000 for some of them. And knowing the entry level wage for a medical assistant across our system, um, asking somebody to go through a $30,000 program just didn't seem equitable. So we started looking at the competencies that we need our medical assistants to achieve and built the apprenticeship based on really what we need out of a medical assistant and what the certifying body for a medical assistant requires. And we built it as a competency-based apprenticeship. So we do have those wage progressions that Cole mentioned. Um, and our program is actually only six months long. So a traditional medical assistant program can be roughly 18 months on $30,000. And our program, uh, because of building it as an apprenticeship program, is six months and usually only about $5,000 and we pay for half of that. So we want people to be able to get into those entry level medical professions without incurring a ton of debt. Nobody wants to start their career out with all that debt. So um, bringing them in at, in that costly manner, um, all we do is ask that people work with us for one year after they complete their programs. And that's how they essentially repay for that tuition contribution that we made. Um, I wish that something like an apprenticeship had existed when I was in school. Um, I think it's a route that I certainly would have pursued, just given that college is expensive and it really might not be the right answer for everybody. A four-year degree um, just might not be that right answer. So being able to go into an apprenticeship program and truly have a mapped out career path and one that you can branch out of into other areas would have been so beneficial. Um, but then the other part of it is a lot of organizations after you become an associate of theirs, they offer th things like tuition reimbursement. So if you do want to continue on your career in any sort of medical field, any area really, um, your employer is often there to help support you through that. So always worth looking into. And we've seen a greater retention rate um, for our employees who have gone through our apprenticeship programs. Uh, one of the really big benefits for us as an employer is we essentially get to mold the training to exactly what we need from those associates. So it's been really great there. And then we get that investment in return from the associate. Um, they see that we've worked really hard to get them to where they want to be. And work to help take care of them through the process. So they feel like a valuable part of the team. And it's really kind of a you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And it's worked out really well for us. Um, as you can see, we've been able to scale to several other areas and we want to continue to scale to those other areas so that we can continue to get people into those roles that really want to be a part of the medical profession, but also might not know how to do it. Awesome. One of the things too that I, I've found is super cool about the apprenticeship model from the apprentice standpoint is, right, you, like you're saying, you graduate from college, you have student debt, you go work for an employer and you might really like where you're working, who you're working with, but you have zero experience. So you're starting out at the bottom of that pay scale. And unless they build in those pay bumps for performance or, you know, over time, the only way you can leverage building your experience is leaving that employer. And if you don't want to do that, then you're kind of stuck. And that's one thing I think is super cool about the apprenticeship model is if you're happy with that employer, you know, it's contracted, it's built in those, as you get the experience, you increase the wages to where then you're going to be at the top of that pay scale, like someone that's been there for, you know, five or 10 years, which is really cool. Uh, Steph absolutely. Stephanie, do you mind just telling us about your experience as an apprentice and going through the program and what made you, you know, how did you get involved with it, even learn about it and, and kind of overall, what was your assessment? Right. So like I was saying before, I started out as a medical assistant and I um, had been a medical assistant for many years and I really enjoyed my job and my position, but I had always wanted to further my career and advance um, 
in in my job duties as to what I was doing. So where I'm at now, we have we are working as with step programs. Like when you start out as a medical assistant, you can move up to like an MA2, gives you a little bit more responsibility, and then you move to an MA3 that gives you more responsibilities on top of that. And that was my step as far as when I made it to that MA3 portion with my employer, where I started doing some of the additional um, duties um, assisting the nurses. I was like, you know, if I'm learning, if you guys teach me to do what the nurses are doing, then I'll be a greater asset to you. So then that's when we started in that additional on the job training to do more of the role of the nursing staff to assist them. Um, Cause you know, nursing is always a shortage anywhere you go. And it's always had, you know, good to have that um, additional help wherever you, you know, you're needed. So I started here slowly building up and then um, again, started that apprenticeship under the nurses here into learning more of what their role is. And then I um, enrolled into the official LPN program um, to get that licensure. So. And, and since your situation with the apprenticeship, it was, did you, you started doing some of the work experience and, and with the mentor and then towards the end went in with the, the traditional right. education? Right. And then also during the schooling, I continue with that apprenticeship. So I'm getting my formal training with the school and then um, additional, you know, the, the, um, the real life training and the clinic as well. Awesome. What would you say was one of the, you know, I don't know if there's a single biggest advantage, but one of the like clear advantages that you felt you received using that model as opposed to someone that goes to school to be an LPN, you know, and gets their licensure and then starts working. So as far as the way I went through um, starting the training first and then going into school, it really helped out in school because I had that training that beforehand to where when I, the instructor was teaching us something new, it would click, oh, I remember that. I remember how to do that. And then it, you can um, incorporate your school with your real life experience. And it just basically gave, I felt like it gave me a little bit more of an advantage while I was in school because I had already started some of that training outside of school to help me to get through the schooling easier, I, not necessarily, but yeah, at, you know, at a, and stay on track, stay on pace and not feel like it was, overwhelming um, because I had already had some of that previous experience. It wasn't all brand new. Okay. Um, Cole or Amanda, if one of you want to take this question, what has been something that's sort of been surprising either as the employer, you know, implementing apprenticeship programs or, you know, as apprenticeship specialist with the state of Montana, as people develop them that are maybe unintended positive outcomes of adopting the apprenticeship mm -hmm. model? Go ahead, Cole. <laughs> okay, yeah, I guess we're both gonna try to pass that one off. <laughs> um, you know, some of the stuff that we've seen is, um, you know, people that, that do the, I guess they say I can't, or I never thought that I could do that. So for example, when it comes to college coursework, um, worked with quite a few people that have just said that, you know, I'm a hands-on learner, I'm never gonna go to college, I'm never gonna get that degree. And we approach, you know, the employer approaches them and says, I've got this apprenticeship opportunity. How do you want to, you know, would you be interested in trying it out? And just that shift in mentality where you say it's an apprenticeship, it's not college coursework. Um, we see apprentices, they complete associate's degrees. And it's really, they're not even, you know, I wouldn't say they're not aware of it, but they don't think of it as the same as, you know, a traditional classroom setting. And it kind of helps overcome some of those barriers. So for people that, you know, learn in different, different ways or different manners that maybe thought, you know, I struggled in math class or I struggled in, you know, a certain subject, I could never go to college. When they get into that apprenticeship, they then realize that they're far more capable than they gave themselves credit for. And by the time they complete it, not only do they complete an apprenticeship, but sometimes they complete a degree along with it. Now that Cole had a chance to talk, I had a chance to think. <laughs> Um, one of the really positive unintended outcomes, um, we have created a far more diverse population of caregivers, and that population mirrors more 
far more mirrors the group that they're helping as well. Um, and it's been wonderful. It's been an opportunity for us to expand into different areas of care for different communities. So really positive, really unintended outcome, but um, something that we continue to see grow with each of our programs. Yeah, that's wonderful. What, uh, we have a few more minutes left, so I have another question or two, and then we can look and see if there's any from the high school students, but um, I just lost my place where I was with my questions. Um, what sort of advice would you give somebody, you know, that, that's interested in, you know, not just a career in healthcare, but also, you know, the apprenticeship model? Is there, um, you know, if we want to talk a couple minutes about, you know, there are opportunities, whether it's youth apprenticeships or pre-apprenticeships for high school students to get engaged that way, but also maybe... Now, Stephanie, what classes would you, you know, highly recommend a high school student taking, whether that's medical terminology or maybe just experiences volunteering, getting a CNA license? Um, you know, so, so maybe start with you, Stephanie, and then Cole and Amanda, you can kind of pick up if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, definitely. If, if the high school students have the opportunity to volunteer or shadow a nurse or an MA in in clinic, definitely go for it. We did have that opportunity with one student here in our high school. She came into our clinic. Um, she was interested in medical and uh, followed our medical assistant around, you know, for an hour or so a day just to kind of get a feel of how the clinic ran. And if that's really something she was interested in. Um, yeah, medical terminology is great. Um, just so that you know, when you're going into either your apprenticeship or your school, you know what the language is. You're, you don't feel like you're lost. Um, math is great. We use a lot of calculations in medical. Um, and then also, um, if they have an opportunity, I know you do that a lot in school of like learning um, medications, just because there's so many types of medications that fall in different classes. That's a big one um, as far as getting to learn all of those. But yeah, terminology and math is, is big. I just want to echo the volunteering piece that Stephanie mentioned. Um, a lot of times we will, we have a youth pre-apprenticeship program in our organization. And a lot of times students that were dead set on a nursing career pathway get their first sight into something truly clinical and behind the scenes and realize they can't do blood, um, which is kind of an important part of nursing. So getting any sort of hands-on experience, shadowing, volunteering that you can so you can truly see the ins and outs of how it all works is so beneficial. Um, high school has also changed a lot since any of us were in school. Um, the course offerings are really diverse now. So just looking into some of those different courses that might not be your traditional electives or looking into concurrent enrollment courses. Um, those are huge <clears throat> into getting a better understanding of different parts of the medical field. And um, often you can get kind of get your shoe in the door by doing some of those volunteering or any of those other youth programs that might be available in your area. And I would say that, you know, both what Stephanie and Amanda said is spot on. Um, getting out there and trying it. Um, here in Montana, we establish pre-apprenticeships and we want the employer and the pre-apprentice both to know that it's a learning moment. And it is for those times where if somebody can't handle the sight of blood, um, we identified up front that that may not be the occupation for them instead of someone going through an entire nursing curriculum and realizing that at the end. But the other thing with it is if you get your foot in the door and get that experience in a facility, maybe blood isn't your thing, but then you notice that they have a billing and coding department and suddenly that's very interesting to you. So that you can still align, you know, your healthcare goals or, you know, if that's your interest, but you can kind of play with those occupations and see where, where your strengths really lie and what, you know, um, you would really like to do. The other thing is just talking to employers or talking to people in the industry, um, get some insight Apprenticeships don't exist without an employer, so there has to be someone willing to have an apprentice come work at the facility. So get, having that conversation and understanding the needs of that facility, it's really great to say, I want to be a x-ray technician uh, apprentice, but if the facility doesn't need an x-ray technician apprentice, then it may not happen. So going in, you know, 
get some some contact and some experience and uh, just understand the needs that are there and what opportunities you know you have. Awesome, thank you all. Well, I think that's about it. I have looks like there's just one question, but um, how has it been with apprenticeships? Any challenges or struggles navigating during a pandemic? It's a lot you could say, probably. <laughs> Um, it forced us to be flexible. It forced our apprentices to be flexible. Um, but it also made for a really resilient group of students. Um, they went into a lot of them for medical assistant, for instance, went into a program for medical assisting and all of a sudden became COVID health screeners to assist across our system. So it's been um, eye-opening for them to know that um, in healthcare, you might be in a particular role, but you might be forced to expand your horizons really quickly. But that also made for a really resilient population of people that are kind of ready to just take whatever is thrown at them. And I think that that's really gonna help them in their careers. Now, one of the things I saw in, in the state of Washington, which was interesting is, you know, when shutdowns started happening, students in traditional either you know two-year or four-year college programs couldn't do their clinicals as the hospitals shut their doors to volunteers and clinicals but the ones that were doing apprenticeships because their employees could still continue on with their training and so they didn't have that break which i thought was a definite advantage to being in an apprenticeship versus the more traditional you know pathway to that career yeah we had the same exact thing in colorado as well All right, well, uh, unless anybody has any final thoughts or anything, you know, last nuggets of wisdom or anything they'd like to share, we can call it a day. I want to uh, thank our panelists for being a part of this and giving us your time today and sharing your thoughts on healthcare and apprenticeships. And uh, to our high school students that attended this, we hope you, know, you got something out of it. And if you have questions, you know, chat with your teachers, you can you know, contact us at the college, uh, you know, email the Montana Registered Apprenticeship Program. Um, Cole's based out of uh, Dillon, right? I vacation in Dillon on the weekends. Uh, okay. <laughs> are somewhere in Montana during the week. So, yeah. so ubiquitous Montana, but um, you know, answer questions and, and like Dale said, you know, get involved, um, you know, volunteer, get experiences that you can, make those connections with employers and kind of see where it goes. But again, thank you all. I appreciate it and have a wonderful day and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.